All right, let's talk about the function of the heroic mission. Let's talk about its inherent value. The heroic mission is the hearthstone. It feeds you. It clothes you. Keeps you fucking warm. It's all-inclusive. It's the complete thing. It's the complete thing. It's batteries included. There's nothing lacking in a man's life who's on a heroic mission. And I hearken back I remember joining forces with a guy who was a little bit younger than me. And we partnered up. There was an edge that I felt that I had discovered in ITF tennis, which if you know anything about tennis, you know that there's levels. There's Challenger, there's ITF, and then there's the main tour. This was a fucking garbage, low-budget tournament that I felt was being mispriced in the global markets. And so I partnered up with this dude and we deployed a fuck ton of capital. For frame of reference, do yourself a favor and go through my fucking media history and look at some of the betting stubs that I've posted. That's a fucking 0.001% reflection of the kind of action that I've thrown down on tennis. <clears throat> so the bottom line is this particular tournament was going on for a week. And we had raised and bundled together as much capital as we could possibly fucking deploy. And we had been on a run prior to this and we had gotten fucking severed. So we're on this run and we're betting like 300 grand a match. Now, understand that this ITF tournament that I was betting on, I think it was in fucking Jakarta, some fucking third world shithole. The players are playing their hearts out. And leaving everything on the line on a daily basis to win, no joke, maybe $10,000 is the grand prize if they get to the final and win. They get like 10 racks. After taxes, like 7 k And I'm betting 300 Gs on dudes who are fighting for seven grand. I would pull up a live stream. And I'm not joking you, the fucking tennis court that they were playing on had like fucking chain link fences. You could see goats wandering in the fucking background. Literal fucking goats and squirrels and fucking rodents and shit are skittering by in the, in the back of the fucking tennis court. It was so low budget, they didn't even have a ball retriever, retrieval girl. Like the players literally had to go recover their own tennis ball to put it back into play. To give you the picture of how low budget this tournament was. And I'm sitting here and we're firing... And we're laughing because I'm like, fuck, man, for 300 Gs, I could buy this whole fucking stadium and put a fucking Brute de Force logo. <laughs> I could fucking paint a Brute de Force logo on the center fucking court. I could own the fucking stadium. So anyway, the strategy that I was running, and there's some life lessons in this if you're sharp and if you're paying attention. I noticed that this particular edge at this moment in time Three-dimensional reality would really throw me off. So when I would watch these matches live and I would be watching the players, the expressions, the athleticism, the grace, the poetry in motion, it would throw me off. But if I would flatten reality and go to a two-dimensional model, which is turn off the fucking live stream and watch the match on a live two-bit pixelated live score feed, I got a much better grasp from my intuition as to what was going on in the match. So in other words, I would have a scoring app open on my phone and every time someone would score a point, it would update instantaneously on the feed. Now, from studying this, I could sense a certain cadence and a certain rhythm that a particular player was in, depending on how fast they scored a point, depending on if they double faulted or not. Do you understand? So I was in a two-dimensional platform, but I was having a much more colorful grasp of what was actually going on in the match because it was all cadence and rhythm. And that was my fucking system, and that was my tool, and that's how I was crushing the books for this particular run. 
Now, the interesting part is we had been wind worn and blood battered prior to this tournament, annihilated. And it had been a couple month long journey. And we were fucking starving. We didn't have money to eat. We couldn't fucking put gas in our cars. We couldn't fucking pay any bills. We couldn't fucking pay it for our insurance. We couldn't pay a motherfucking thing. And we would laugh to ourselves that we could not tell anybody this story because nobody would believe that we were betting $300,000 a day on tennis matches, but we couldn't fucking put food in our body. And what people don't understand about a mission, this is the fundamental thing here, is that that doesn't matter. None of that matters. That's an adventure built into the adventure. That was the gamble within the gamble. That was the sweat within the sweat and the sustenance the sustenance that we were repleted with on a daily basis of knowing that we were exploiting an edge and we were going to tackle this tournament then walk away with a couple million bucks each allowed us to press on in fucking miserable conditions now i personally have gone on very long stretches of droughts where nothing has clicked nothing has worked i wake up every fucking day and deploy every fucking thing i have with my fucking army and things ain't clicking. I've gone through fucking nine month droughts where I didn't see, I didn't turn a profit for nine straight months. And I'm out here fucking killing myself every fucking day to get a jackpot, right? Here's what happens. We are so deployed on this particular tournament. My boy literally has fucking holes in his shoes. His shoes, the soles are so worn out. The bottoms are so fucking erased it's like he's walking on fucking ice skates i'm wearing a fucking cashmere fucking track suit every fucking day that's got fucking holes in it from being abusive in the fucking laundry machine because i don't give a fuck i'm not gonna hang dry anything when i'm on a fucking mission i'm throwing shit in the fucking washer i'm drying at high temperatures my shit's fucking shrinking on me i'm just abusing the fuck out of my clothing every fucking possession i have just to cope and just get by every day And you learn really quickly that when you are dedicated to something with all your heart and all your muster, it's almost like inanimate objects. You, you can suck the life out of these things and you get a lot more juice. You're able to squeeze the juice out of inanimate objects more than an ordinary person could ever dream of. You know what I mean? Like you could literally rock a pair of shoes for two fucking years and it's falling apart and somehow you just make it work. There's, there's weird spiritual properties that go on when you're in this frame of mind. Your fucking car gas tank will be at fucking zero. It'll be at empty. And somehow you become one with the car and you fucking juice an extra fucking 40, 50 miles out of the zero on the gas tank. Shit like that. Like you are just soul sucking. You're smack squeezing the maximum amount of fucking juice out of the properties of the things that you have because you learn to be parsimonious and you learn to be very, very economical with your resources. It becomes a style. It becomes a particular way of just handling physics in dimension, in time and space. And this is what the mission does to you. This is what the mission does to you. And when I see on Twitter... This was my grand epiphany this morning. When I see shit like monk mode being pushed, when I see shit like no fap being pushed, it dawned on me that all of that shit is already pre-factored and it's pre-fabbed into the mission. The mission contains all of those things that people who don't have a mission are trying to isolate and trying to remove from the equation. Monk mode is built into any mission. Ask any founder how lean and agile they have to fucking be when they're launching shit off the ground, when they're bootstrapping, when they're committing every fucking resource and every morsel of blood and tear into a project. Ask those motherfuckers how monastic they're living. They're living like monks. You know what I mean? When you're dedicated, when you have your eyes so fucking lasered in on that prize, there's, there's moments in time where you don't even want to talk to a woman. You don't, want, you don't want sex. You don't want fucking any of it. You want to be left the fuck alone until you fucking win. 
There's your nofap built in. There's your fucking monk mode built in. The mission contains all the constituent components, all these fucking optimizers, all these motherfuckers who are removing these components and isolating them. They don't understand that the mission gives you all of it. It's just going to happen. Even the meditation. There's losses you're going to take. There's liver punches you are going to endure and absorb when you are on a true fucking mission that are going to put you in reticence. Things that will silence you, things that will quiet you, where it literally feels like you are doing pull-ups with a fucking 100-pound weighted vest just to speak a sentence. That's how arduous it gets. That's how difficult some of these projects are to pull off. You will be so fatigued, so fucked up, That uttering a sentence, mustering the fucking energy within you to muster vocal tones will feel like you are deadlifting 900 pounds. You're just stunned into silence every fucking day because things are so bizarre when you are in this frame of mind. Now, here's the irony. A man on a mission don't need game because he is the game. You know what I'm saying? Like when I would go in public disheveled, wearing the same fucking drag suit I've worn for like a week and a half because I don't give a fuck about laundry. My aura, I am burning so fucking bright. Motherfuckers are fine tuned. You're common normie, common folk, the elf people, whatever the fuck you want to call them. Those motherfuckers are breaking their neck when you walk into a room. When, you're, when you have this level of dedication and you take a break in your day to run to a coffee shop and grab a fucking espresso, you look at the motherfuckers who know this guy's up to something. And it don't matter how tattered your fucking clothes are. You could pull any fucking bitch from any fucking ecosystem in a heartbeat. Because when you're on a mission and you're focused and you're dominating your own mental space, you, you literally don't have time to calculate your imperfections. Your insecurities... They disappear. They evanesce. They're donezo. They don't exist. You're not in a self-reflective state where you're tearing yourself down like that. Mentally, you are calibrated and you are dialed in. Therefore, you couldn't give two fucks about any perceived deficits in yourself in that state of mind. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. That's why the motherfucker in the hoodie and the fucking sweatpants and the Nikes who's, who's building every fucking day. That motherfucker don't have to put on a fucking suit and do monkey dances to get women. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, he doesn't have to put on fucking oversized clown shoes. That is game. That's built-in game. When I tell you the mission feeds and clothes you and warms you and gives you love and community, I'm not joking. It's all-encompassing. When we were on that run, my boy was sending me photos. He's driving a shit box beater of a car his windshield was cracked fucking a crack from one end to the other fucking end looked like the fucking san andreas fault and he's sending me photos and we're laughing we're like bro we have millions of dollars deployed right now and we don't give a fuck what we're driving we don't give a fuck about repairs we don't give a fuck what our gas tank looks like we don't even give a fuck if we're hungry we'll figure it out we will figure it out. When it's time to eat, we're going to figure it out. But all of that shit is come secondary. It's completely fucking ancillary. And I want to say even tertiary after a certain point. I mean, this dude literally was in an apartment with like asbestos. He had like fucking paint chips ripped off the wall. It was an unpresentable living situation. And nobody would believe this guy is so hungry and so destined to finish the job that he began. He doesn't give a fuck that he's living in squalor. It doesn't matter. When you're locked in, I've experienced it. I've experienced being so hell bent and so passionate while I'm on a run where I just have clothes strewn all over my fucking floor and no joke, exchanging even a fucking modicum of mental bandwidth to pick up a fucking t-shirt and put it in the hamper literally feels like I'm fucking squatting 450 pounds mentally 
mentally it's so exhausting thinking about doing fucking trivial tasks i will let fucking cups pile up cups ain't going back in the right place i'm spilling fucking water on the floor got zero zero fucks to give zero patience to wipe that shit up my girl will do it you understand like this is the gift this is the true fucking gift of the mission the things that don't matter in life all fade away by osmosis you don't even have to do self-improvement work. You don't even have to sit there and fucking think because things are going to happen along the way that are so death-defying and so bizarre that it's going to force you in and contort you into those very positions that you're trying to optimize for without a mission. I'm telling you, I've been stunned into meditation where I had no fucking choice but to sit there with my jaw clenched close my fucking eyes and process what just happened forced meditation forced monk mode forced no fap we could go on and on and on and on and you cannot find me one single of those modalities that is not pre-embedded into the mission it's all there for the taking all of it And this perfectly, perfectly coincides with my essay this morning. Because the people who have an addictive personality, first of all, I want to be very clear, okay? Every, and I will say every, and I'll stand by this, every motherfucker who's running a big company, running a big show, a tastemaker, a kingmaker, anybody who has any power and influence, the people who program you on a daily basis, who stick media in your face, okay? All of those motherfuckers have vices that if you could see under the hood would mortify you, would absolutely mortify you. But the real wisdom, the real wisdom, and nobody will tell you this but me, is that all of these people learned through years of cultivation and trial and error how to take their afflictions, put them on their back like a fucking rucksack and walk up the mountain anyway, in spite of it, in spite of it. And then you come to the Jungian completion, which is that you have integrated your shadow. And now the dark forces in you that were once destructive, that were once destroying your life and tearing you apart at the seams and ravaging your relationships now becomes your biggest strength. And here's why. That bonfire of energy for the few of us that are blessed with a very highly addictive personality, you have an energy tap that motherfuckers would kill to have. You have unlimited energy, unlimited, because it's the obsession. It, it, it grinds your fucking gears. You have to move. You can't sit still. There's no vegetating on the fucking couch. There's no sitting down. There's no laziness there. You might sit down for a 30-second break, and your mind is looking for rocks to disinter. You're looking for fucking treasure to unearth. Your brain is going to force you to get up and move around and do things and think in a creative fashion. Do you understand? So here's the thing. If you have an addictive personality, clinicians will despise me for this, but I'm right. You have one shot. You have one option, which is beautiful, right? Because male freedom, men have the most freedom when you give them no choice. That is when a man is most free. It's a paradox. Okay? A man experiences liberty when he has no other choice. You know what I'm saying? Fate, fate is doing willingly that which you must do. That's the definition of fate. Fate is doing willingly that which you must do. That is freedom. And when you narrow a man's choices, life gets very easy, no matter how hard the path is. As long as you give a man a path and you give him a path forward, 
a man can overcome fucking anything. Any fucking thing. I've seen it time and time again. And so the person with the addictive mind, with the addictive mind, the solution is not to go to rehab and melt your fucking brain and destroy your edge and normify yourself to the point where you are scared of adventure or scared of increasing dopamine because you're on a slippery slope. That is where you are going to die. And that is where you are going on the assembly line to be a mass produced product. I can tell you that for a fact, the recidivism rate in any rehab program is through the roof. I want to say it's like 99% because nobody, nobody is able to evade their true nature. It's impossible. It's impossible. You can tile over it. You can fucking build structures on top of it. You can fucking do whatever the fuck you want to do with cute engineering. But when that oak tree stump is ready to burst through your fucking living room, it's going to do it. And it's not going to do it on your terms. And that's how powerful nature is. So if you have an addictive personality, if you have an obsessive personality, your only option in life is to build a system that can help you outrun it and outlast it. How the fuck do you think I can smoke two or three packs of cigarettes a day and feel zero, and I emphasize zero, deleterious effects? My performance in the gym has not decreased a lick since I started smoking. Neither has my cardio. That's me personally. Because everything else I do is maniacally counterbalancing the system. I'm a fucking health freak. The way that I eat, the way that I fucking train, the way that I move, the way that I experience the sun, the way that I breathe fresh air. All of that shit is a counterbalancing force. I can do whatever the fuck I want because of that. Do you understand? So if you have an addictive personality, you have to build a system that is so powerful, so outrageously strong, that it can handle the damage from indulging in the thing that you know that you can't stop doing. And I'm going to tell you something. If something you desire to do is so easy to, cl- to quit with the flip of a fucking switch, you never had any passion for life anyway. If, if you can fucking just stop smoking right now, you would never enjoyed cigarettes. I'll tell you that right now. You never truly, truly fucking enjoyed cigarettes. And that's a fucking tried example, but let's extrapolate this out. Let's talk about the fucking alcoholic. I said it in the essay, and it deserves expansion because it's a very, very controversial point of view. The alcoholic has to learn how to make the alcohol the reward and not the escape. In other words, he has to shift his entire life to such a cataclysmic magnitude that he is so interjected in the scene. He's so involved. He's the proprietor. He's the proctor of his own journey where there are so many people depending on him. He has to wriggle his way through the hierarchy and has to land himself some sort of CEO, high paying position where people count on his leadership. Things where things are flying out of midair every day and he's got to fucking troubleshoot because that's going to keep him whip fucking sharp. It's going to keep his eye on the ball. And what happens is for all of these, and I want to call them this, functional alcoholics, which I dare tell you again, every motherfucker at the top has some sort of functional, let's call, him a, let's call it a functional illness, Okay. It's called a functional illness, a functional illness that they have learned through years of pain and hardship, how to harness and take the energy out of it. I do not believe that in the male hardware, because look, we all know trauma and pain from an early age gets stored. It clearly gets stored in our mind and body, probably in our tissues as well. But I do not think after a lot of self-experimentation and talking to other people, I do not believe that that trauma is supposed to be released. I think it's supposed to be harnessed. 
really weird shit starts to happen to people when they start releasing this stuff. You know what I mean? Going to Burning Man and start doing fucking weird rituals to try to release their pain. It's, uh, cat- it's catastrophic things happen to the psyche. And you guys know what I'm talking about. You, you, you will never point me in the direction of someone who has been obsessed with doing self-improvement bullshit. You can never show me that that person's life got any better. There's just no fucking way. They become a mess. They become a complete fucking head case. 10 out of 10 times. 10 out of 10 fucking times. So the alcoholic has to be so busy, has to create so many fucking forces of energy that are pressing upon him that he has no choice but to kind of fight back and respond and get himself into a toehold of a decent, solid position in life. Even if he has a family, even if he has kids, that extra pressure becomes good. Where these addictions become very dangerous is when people withdraw and estrange themselves from society and then indulge them. That's when they die. That's when they OD. It's when it becomes a secret. It's when it becomes your fucking dirty little secret that you're a fucking alcoholic and you're boozing and hiding it from everybody and you're fucking ducking behind counters and swigging bottles and shit. That's when it gets really fucking ugly. But the guy who owns it, the guy who owns it and understands his nature and says, you know what? I genuinely don't believe that I'm ever going to be able to stop doing this, nor do I want to. That, that motherfucker needs a gigantic fucking life. Elephants, tigers, bears, everything, fucking giant bats. He needs to be flanked every fucking day with a type of pressure where he has to maintain his standing and character in society with people counting on him. And that will not dissipate the energy of drinking. But what it will do is when he comes home and he accomplished everything that he was supposed to accomplish for the day, that motherfucker can afford to booze. He can afford to booze at that point because it's now the reward and not the escape. Do you understand? So he's built a system. He's built a reputation. He's built an entire modality of living that's allowing him to outrun the craving. That's how it actually works at the top. When people talk about functional alcoholics, functional fucking cokeheads, this is what's going on. These motherfuckers never went to therapy. They never fucking went to Burning Man. They never did fucking release work. They zoomed in on the picture and they threw it on their fucking shoulders like a rucksack and they walked up the mountain anyway. And they become, they became a smashing fucking success because of it. Because this is parochial wisdom. You cannot deny your own nature. It's never going to happen. You know, this was a silly fucking comedic story to some, but to me, it was fucking serious. I remember that fucking post on Twitter. There was an old man who was dingy as fuck. I believe he hadn't showered in like 50 years or some shit. And he was covered in fucking mud and filth and dross. And they showed a picture of him. And this motherfucker was literally fucking caked. It looked like he was fucking caked in fucking fudge. And somebody bathed him. Somebody gave him the opportunity to bathe or shower. I forget how the fucking story ended. But the bottom line is... The motherfucker showered and died the next day. (laughs) He died the next day. They killed the motherfucker because he stopped leaning into his nature. That's actually the moral of that fucking story. The moral of that fucking story is that motherfucker probably had a good 10 more years in him doing shit the way he was doing it. And the the motherfucker folded one day, forgot who he was, took a fucking bath, and fucking croaked. Now, that story is fucking funny on on some level. But at the same time, the lesson there, that's not a fucking coincidence. Like, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand what really happened there. (laughs) It just doesn't. Like, that's as real of an example as you could possibly see. I mean, look. The most apt metaphor for the mission stuff is the captain going down with the ship. The captain going down with the ship. And if you know anything about the captain's archetype, 
the captain finds a holistic connection with the ship and the way that it's being run. And when they say going down with the ship, that was a true thing. But that, 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 that fucking metaphor also rises out of an era where you have to understand that the completion of building a ship and everything that it took to run a ship at that time was rare. You know what I mean? Like it was a feat just to be able to assemble a fucking fleet of voyagers and fucking take a, a trip on the great open sea. But that metaphor going down with the ship, the captain's connection to his mission, to his ship, to his crew, because we all know that a captain during a fucking mayday situation could easily, easily fucking jump overboard, swim off and find some other void to fill the existential dread, right? Pick up a new endeavor, fucking get saved with the rest of the crew. But this motherfucker is so holistically connected to the process of sailing, of being a voyager, of being a visionary, of leading his crew, that he realizes there's nothing that can replace that connection. It's over for him. So he's going to go down with the fucking mission. That's such a fucking beautiful metaphor. The fucking captain going down with the fucking ship. I mean, that's what the mission offers you. It offers you the opportunity to go down swinging for something that you believe in with your fucking core. And it's not a one-way relationship. It's a fucking two-way relationship. Because we just discussed the types of things that the mission provides for you. We talked about how it'll let you squeeze the life out of the inanimate. It'll let you squeeze the life out of things that you never knew you could squeeze the life out of because you have no other choice. And that's where the fucking emancipation comes from. And that's where the freedom comes from. And that's where the liberty comes from is having that fucking mission. You are a free man. You know, people asked me one of the, one of the biggest questions that I've gotten recently is people are, People want to understand my mind frame when I came into $17 million and blew it. People want to know what that was like. People want to know the architecture, the, the story behind it. People want to know how that came to be. When I amassed that fortune in 2017, I knew I was fucked. I knew I was fucked because I came into the money accidentally because I just went on a fucking tear and I was ripping shots and things were just clicking and I went on a fucking improbable run and I amassed that kind of wealth. But there was a part of me at the time that knew I didn't have the systems that I'm telling you about right now. You need to outrun it. I didn't have the systems at all. And I knew I had just fucked myself by coming into that kind of money. Only a motherfucker who understands the obsessive personality and how nothing's ever good enough and how as humans we want to test our potential and test our limits can understand what the fuck I'm telling you right now. It was not about the money for me. It's that I knew that I was going to go for 100 mil. I knew it wasn't good enough. I knew it wasn't fucking good enough for me. And if, if, if the average person came into that kind of money, they would be doing everything in their fucking power to safeguard it and safe keep it. They would feel like they beat the game of life. They can rest on their laurels. For me, it was the opposite. When I walked into that sum of money, I saw it as the opposite opportunity. This was not an opportunity to fucking sequester it and fucking take Shots like that. This was an opportunity to me to be granted the very rare opportunity. What I saw as a very rare opportunity. How many men on earth get the chance to come into $17 million, blow every penny, having as much fun and YOLOing and wiling out as fucking humanly possible and knowing that at the end of it, when it all goes away, you're going to get it back. I saw it as an opportunity because I am an experience. I'm a fucking, you don't understand. I, me and my boy, that guy with me on the run, we're fucking medieval scryers. We're fucking tinkering in the fucking lab. We got fucking green substances fizzing in fucking chemist flasks. 
We got fucking Bunsen burners. We're fucking always in the lab divinating the future. Literally. Like fucking scryers. That's literally the fucking archetype. And so I saw this as an opportunity when I got that money. I wanted to know what it does to a human being. What does it do to your consciousness? What does it do to your soul? What does it do to your spirit? What does it do to your fucking mind to to piss away that kind of money? I needed to know. My curiosity. I needed to know what it does to a human being to squander that kind of money. And so I was completely fearless, completely fearless. I burned that 17 M's in six months, torched all of it, spent every fucking penny, betting a million bucks a game, fucking betting $500,000 on each hand of Baccarat, buying the craziest whips. Listen to me. I've lived, I've driven all the best whips on the planet. I've lived in the nicest homes you can possibly fucking fathom. None of it means a thing. None of it means a thing. The people with the obsessed mind who are obsessed with the mission are playing a very, very different game. A very different game. We are here to enhance and understand humanity, the human spirit, and we are here to go to hell to extract the nuggets of fucking wisdom that we can pass on to our children. That's what we're here to do. And I'm one of those motherfuckers and I saw it as an opportunity to just be free, to just freely be fucking playful with this batch of money because I know, knew for a fact that I, could, that I would get it back because that's just the mentality that I have. When I play games, I've always played with a, with a, with a lightness to it. I've always been able to play free. It's one of my greatest strengths. When I've walked into poker games and bought in for 900000 I will play a $900,000 hand the same way I would play a recreational 50-cent hand on a fun family Christmas game. I play the same way. Don't matter what the stakes are. Doesn't matter if it's more pressure. I play the same way. I, the fundamentals of the game never fucking change for me. I'm as reckless playing for a buck as I am with a million bucks in front of me. And that, my friends, is a skill that takes decades to fucking cultivate. You know what I'm saying? When I was, when I was blowing things up and I was detonating shit on the way up and I've, I've blown up so many runs, I've blown up so many businesses, I've blown up so many companies, I've blown up so many relationships in my 20s trying to fight to get these systems put in place these engines of chaos that I wanted to, to roar to protect me from myself and that fucking chaotic Dionysian energy that emanates from me. Because you have to have that if you're going to go far and you have the kind of energy that I have because I don't give a fuck about money. But at the same time, I love the game. So the money, to me, is a demonstration of competence. That's all it is. Just a demonstration of fucking competence. And so when I went through that process of losing that money and spending as freely and as wickedly as I possibly could, I I told you guys, I experienced zero identity or swagger change with the 17 mil or without it. When I torched everything, I was the same guy. Just as fucking vivacious, just as fucking passionate. I didn't fucking take any hits or any dings or any dents to my identity. Because I had already chosen the lifestyle that I wanted to live prior to coming into the money. And nobody could take that from me. I always had that freedom and flexibility. So for me, I was able to just play freely, take my shots. Obviously, I wasn't trying to lose. But my point was, I was taking shots with that kind of money where I didn't give a fuck if I did or didn't. You know what I mean? And like, there's all, so you can fucking play with this as a thinking experiment every which way possible. You can treat it like a fucking Rubik's cube. Could I have given fucking 5 million of it to my best friend and had him fucking safe, keep it for me and tell him, don't let me touch it for three years. So you have something if you lose blah, blah. Like we can go through all these different fucking scenarios of protective models. But the bottom line is I'm the type of motherfucker where if I gave a buddy of mine 5 million to hang on to, and he didn't fucking give it back. 
<laughs> when I needed it, it would destroy the relationship. Relationship would be torched. It'd be toast. I don't know. I, I cannot hold myself to an agreement that I'm not going to touch this money for three years. I don't know what's going to come up. I don't know what fucking scratches that I have to itch in the, in the coming days. I don't know what I want to do. So I could never make that commitment. And that's why I did not stick that money in safety vehicles to protect myself. Because I'm staying true to my spirit and I'm trying, staying true to myself. I knew it would absolutely contaminate the fabric and integrity of my relationships with my boys. So I had to fucking put it on my own shoulders and be responsible for facing and staring down that loss. And it was nothing, by the way. Not as crazy as you think. People who have their identity wrapped up in money and status and shit, like if that's the type of shit that gets your rocks off and makes you feel like a, like a bad boy, more power to you. Never did for me. I've tried it every which way possible. I've beaten the game several fucking times and then gone back down the mountain and reset and started again to see what, what other little fucking angles I can find in the human condition. That's just who I am. I'm a fucking tinkerer. You know what I mean? Like I could have retired several fucking times. You motherfuckers never would have known my name or known my existence if I fucking safeguarded that 17 amps. I probably never would have made my debut on Twitter. But I had to go back and play the game again and prove to myself that I could build it and find different angles and become stronger. And I've said this on prior spaces, and this is one of the truest things I will ever fucking tell you, is some of us that come from rocky upbringings and shit, every time we go to hell, we come back so much stronger that we start to froth at the mouth to go back. Like, we don't mind going back to hell because every time we've been there, we just come out bigger, better, stronger, faster, wiser. And so the, the, the difficult part is as you get older, as you get more my age, you have to learn how to tame that beast a little bit. You know what I mean? Like you can't keep going back to hell all the fucking time. And that's where you learn the restraint. And that's where you start building the system that you have in place. You know what I'm saying? And, and I have that system. That system is still formulating for me, but I am still, I'm 36 years old and I am like 80% of the way of completing the most badass fucking system on earth that will allow me to take whatever fucking shots I desire in any market to infinity. I'm getting close. I'm getting real close. And it's been my life's work. My life's work has been how can I build a fucking system? How can I fashion an operation that will allow me to play the games that I want to play uninhibited and fully unrestricted? And I've been fucking soldiering on for fucking two decades. Like when I tell the alcoholic that he has to fucking lean into his nature and build the systems around it, that's not going to happen overnight. It's years of struggle. And immense personal torture and shit because you have, you know, you got media, you got fucking modern mental health and shit telling you that you need to be normal. Don't get too excited. Shit like that. Like it's just fucking everywhere. And to decondition and deprogram yourself and realize that that's the fucking short path to the slaughterhouse if you decide to go that route. <laughs> You're left with the only fucking conclusion is that if you are blessed, by the way, if you do have an addictive personality, you are a hunter brain through and through. You ain't a farmer. Only hunter brains get those kind of afflictions. And that means that you do have the upside because everything's about the upside. Fuck the downside. Everything's about the upside. You have the upside potential and capability of being a fucking great. You do. It's there. It just has to be upholstered and it has to be attended to daily, daily. You have to fucking nurture these aspects of yourself and really fucking climb the fucking ladder and play the game of capitalism. You have to be a proctor in society. The minute you withdraw is when you're fucked. That's when these demons are going to eat you alive. So as long as you can keep a fucking toehold, in society, in family, then you can really build some fucking badass infrastructure around these habits that fucking tear you down. Let's bring up some, some questions here. Try to stay on topic as best you can. 
please. What's up, Zachy? What's up? I wanted to ask with your with the seventeen million that you, you squandered. Do you yeah. think there comes any kind of disgust as well? Because for me, hearing it like to get seventeen million, as you were saying, then to just to try and save it all, that kind of disgusts me because it kind of it brings a sense of that defines you. Then you have seventeen million now; everything in your life has to change. Did that ever disgust you, or was it completely different? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. Look, dude, I think. Hold on, I'm rolling a cig again. Do me a favor. Say that last part. I think you mentioned something about did, when I got the money, did I feel like my life was going to change? No, no, I meant like I, did, I, didn't think, I didn't think that you were saying that, but I, I was saying in the sense that did it disgust you like when, when you're in your 20s burning down companies or like just running through shit? Were you doing that just to find dude, out how much you could dude. do? Dude, it's the fucking most horrifying process on earth. There's nothing glamorous about it at all. But when you're talking about integrating shadows and you're talking about trying to tame the beast that you have within you and the fire in your soul, that is collateral damage. Those types of consequences do happen when you're burning with that kind of fucking passion, bro. Like there's no way to avoid it. There's no way to avoid it. Otherwise, you're just going to fucking implode. You're just going to fucking implode and completely fucking implode. Um, the other, the other point that I want to add to that is that I believe the masculine imperative lies in repeatability. Okay. I believe the demonst true demonstration of competence for men is establishing the fact that if you have done something before you can do it again. I think that is what actually demarcates the men from the boys. In other words, if an athlete can win a championship, can you fucking come back and win it again? Um, my case is similar. I always had, and this is just a deep intuition in my heart. It's, it's ineffable. It's something that I, I, it's, it's ineffable. It's personal to me. I've always felt that if I was able to get $17 million playing freely, fucking around, taking huge risks, goofing off and having a great time the entire time that I did it, then I had the full faith and conviction that I could do it again. Because I believe re repeatability is how you establish your male competence. So I had no qualms about starting over and fucking doing it again. Okay, that makes sense. And when you're saying, when you integrate the shadow to the self and you're talking about afflictions, do you think they're actually afflictions or are they actually blessings? Because I mean, I know there's perspective, but in my view, I think they're actually blessings and obviously you have to work out how to use them, but I don't think they're anything other than that. I mean, they're huge blessings. I've, I've said this before, and I'll reinforce the point because I think more people need to hear this. I believe the body is so brilliant that it, it, it shapes your personality in a way to deal with the painful reality that you've experienced. So, like, the ego is a great example. People are always talking about kill your ego. You got to have a fucking spiritual death. All of that's bullshit. Your ego is equipped and specifically designed to handle things like heartbreak for example like if you got your heart mauled by a woman right and when you were young you know that you puffed yourself up the next day and tried to fucking talk yourself up and you tried to fucking you know overcompensate for it maybe you went to the gym for fucking three weeks in a row tried to get bigger badder stronger tried to get your comeuppance on the situation well that's your ego and if you didn't have an ego heartbreak would be so painful that I don't even think most men could even continue to trek on. And so it's like you start to look at these things in the human organism and even in the spiritual realm, the things that we've been granted and blessed with, the feelings, the emotions, the ego, all these mechanisms have a purpose. And I think it's completely anti-nature to claim that any of these things are bad. You know what I mean? And that's like the liberal... Yeah. If you really want to look at the architecture of the liberal policy, liberals hate the animal inside man, kind. That's what they're attacking. Liberals are liberal policy. Any liberal doctrine, what it's really doing is attacking the barbaric nature of man that cannot be tamed. It explains veganism. It explains fucking a lot of different, a lot of different fucking things that I could go on and on about. But the bottom line is, bro, is that the ego is a beautiful thing. The personality quirks that you have are all fucking beautiful things. The problem is, is they have to be implemented into society in a way that 
is in a almost like a bountiful way. It has to build up the people around you. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. People get hurt along the way all the time. But it doesn't mean that there's not a re- reconciliation period where you get it all back and you fucking handle those those past issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. So we have to embrace all these mechanisms in the body. You know what I mean? Like all these disorders, all these crazy, bizarre disorders that people have, the body gave them that as a fucking coping mechanism for a very specific reason. Yeah, with uh, with addictive personality as well, can you talk about specifically how you actually embrace that? Because, I mean, for example, I never used to touch coffee because I know I have a completely addictive personality. And then when I decided, like, it was working wonders for me and I, I wake up and have three double espressos every day like completely the, the, the opposite extreme so how do you actually harness that yeah exactly it's like it's gonna be one of the two for you you're either gonna go cold turkey or you're gonna be fucking ripping espressos every day how i go about it is if i'm gonna fucking smoke cigs and i'm gonna fucking drink coffee i'm gonna be the highest paid fucking cigarette smoker for my life let, let me give you let me give you a fucking rudimentary example I was chain gunning cigs in a casino with my boy many years ago and I was playing craps and I was playing like a hundred thousand a roll in a private room and I won like 1.2 million in like an hour. Went to the fucking Rolex store, bought a bunch of shit, came back, was having a good time. He was talking to me, to me about my smoking habit and I told him to pull out his calculator and I was like, listen, pull out your calculator on your phone. I was like, we're going to run some numbers real quick. He was like, all right. I was like, do the math. I was like, I just smoked 30 cigarettes in one hour when I won that 1.2 million. I was like, you tell me how much I was paid. What is the breakdown? How much money was I paid per cigarette smoked in that hour? He ran the numbers. It was something fucking astronomical, something fucking out of this realm. And I looked at him and obviously, dude, I was fucking being a little bit facetious, but the point yeah. still remains. I looked at him and I smirked and I said, bro, I'm the highest pay- cigarette. <laughs> I'm the highest paid cigarette motherfucking smoker in, in the world right now. I just got paid professionally to smoke cigarettes. So like that's when I talk about reframe, when I talk about how great men have to play mind games with themselves, that's the, these are the lengths you have to go to, to, to justify taking shots sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like, If you're going to fucking slam coffees, bro, you better be fucking using that energy to do something. Like you better be, you better be pushing your boundaries and pushing your limits in some fashion. Like I don't just smoke for the sake of fucking smoking. When I smoke, I am doing a lot of different things at once. It's it's, to me, a cigarette is a fucking Swiss army knife. It's a Swiss army knife. It's multi-purpose. It's multi-utilitarian. I'm using the cigarette and the mechanics. I've, see, I've realized for me, it's not even really drawing the smoke into my lungs. It doesn't even. It's more of the mechanics of smoking. Just the, the repetition of moving my hand back and forth. It has a very relaxing, soothing component that just allows me to fucking manhandle situations on the side while I'm doing it. It's been built up over years, right? Like built you built up with. over years. I have zero desire to quit. It's counterbalanced. I mean, dude, I'm fucking, for all intents and purposes, for 36, I'm healthy as fuck. I mean, I'm still power cleaning 350. I'm still snatching close to 300 pounds. Like, my strength is through the fucking roof. I'm battered. I'm injured. I'm beaten up. I've defied every fucking physicist. I've defied every fucking medical professional that told me this was not possible. So it's like, why the fuck would I curtail anything when I have the life experience to back it up? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, it gets to a point where you build these systems and you've proven it over and over and over again that no one can tell you a fucking thing. And that's when you're in pole position. And that's really the position that every man desires to be in is when you're in a position where people can't tell you how to live because you've just proven that this is the way to go. Yeah. So anyway, bro, I appreciate the discourse. I'm going to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Yo, pack run. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, bro? <clears throat> yeah, so on the topic of addiction, um, 
Do you think, well, I personally think every man is addicted to sex. And also, like, because every man is addicted to sex, it powers them to do just great things. How do you feel about that? Dude, 100%. I had a tweet a couple weeks ago that I stand by. I said, the, the most hyper successful people I know have one of two qualities. Literally, I've narrowed it down. It's either a horrible depression that they have, so they sort of wear a costume and a veneer over it, and that propels them to do prolific things, or extreme levels of horniness. Horniness towards women channeled in the proper direction builds fucking empires, dude. It just does. I mean, we can make the argument that all energy is sexual energy, and it just depends on where you put it. But the common denominator from all hyper, hyper, hyper high achieving motherfuckers that I know is extreme fucking horniness for sure. Libido. Facts. I, I think now here's um, the deal. Here's the deal. We live in a world now where men are obsessed with sex, but they don't have the libido or the drive to go get it. And that's fucking hell on earth. Like definitely. I, yeah. I also think um, they're not channeling that energy through guilt. And I think that's pretty much uh, paramount in any addiction you have. Like you're guilty about it. So exactly. you're not channeling the dog. It's a secret. Correct. It becomes a secret. It becomes a shameful thing that people repress over and over and over again. And then you develop sort of this dissociation, dissociated personality where you start blocking it out and pretending it doesn't exist. And that's when the tigers and the wolves and the jackals within you start to fucking eat you alive. They start to eat the carrion of your own fucking body. hundred fucking percent. That's why I said the people who are high achieving with these quote unquote afflictions, they have learned to own and embrace them and see them as friendly deities. That's the only really way to sort of reframe it. And then once you learn to overpower these things and develop a lot of other parts of your personality, it actually becomes rather easy to manage. It becomes easy for these guys, like these people who were raging alcoholics in their twenties and they got blackout drunk and maybe they fucking got scathed by the long arm of the law sometimes. And maybe got a fucking DUI. A lot of those people didn't stop drinking. They just simply built a system. Like I said, that helped them outlast it. And now, 10 years later, they still drink, but they've just figured out through so much trial and error how to just kind of incorporate it into the overstructure of their life and make it work. And it's brutal. It's, it's the, literally the hardest thing a human being could do because it's like con- trying to contain a raging forest fire. You know what I mean? Like the addictive personality, it's not a lighter. It's not a lighter with butane that you can fucking flick on and off. It's, it's a raging forest fire is what it is. But it's within you. And so you have to utilize it or it's just going to fucking burn you to a crisp. And I've seen that more often than not. Especially by the people who start denying and rejecting these aspects of themselves. Like I said, once it becomes a secret and you're trying to hide it from everybody, you're playing a very, very dangerous game. Way more dangerous than the guy who's like, fuck it. This is my makeup. This is my genetics. This is literally who the fuck I am. I'm going to own this shit. And I'm going to fucking push this thing to the fucking brink. I respect that guy. I respect the fuck out of that guy. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. MH. Can't hear you. Yo, Bruce. What's up, man? Uh, what's your take on the role of belief in, in all of this? So, like, the mechanics of the carnivore diet or the mechanics of smoking cigarettes or the mechanics of putting these systems in place versus actually having the belief in those systems. Is it is it something that you think supercharges um, what you're doing or is it more like a mechanical thing and it's just another piece of the puzzle? No, I don't think it's a mechanical thing. I think the belief does have to be outrageous in the in the being. 
I, I think I think that's the foundation. I think the unreasonable, unshakable, yet genuine belief in oneself is sort of the is sort of like the cornerstone of all this. It's the pillar that holds everything together. And and that is sort of the wellspring where all of this other stuff is possible. It's just knowing that you have the longevity and you're never going to quit because if you're playing games that you really enjoy and you really love, even if you're terrible at them, and as long as you know you're never going to fucking stop until you beat the game, I, you, like you're going to get there. But the thing is, I've never seen someone who believes it down to their bone that they were going to be something. I've never seen someone who really fucking internalized that not become it. I've never seen that. It's the people who fake it till you make it. It's the people who fucking put on a costume and fucking sing and dance somebody else's song. Those guys end up mangled. Like we all end up mangled is the point. Like there's no human, nobody gets through this life without fucking, you know what I mean? The thunderbolts of Zeus raining down upon them. But the point is, is when you're playing games that you're actually interested in, piggybacked by that fucking belief that unshakable belief when you do get to the top then you can really focus on the healing stuff <clears throat> but like no man is ever going to get to the top of their craft without extreme torture and self-abuse because i mean that it's it's a, it's a defiance of homeostasis like you're defying nature to even make that climb and take upon that quest in the first place. So of course things are going to be fucking mutilated. Of course your spirit is going to be fucking annihilated. Of course your mind is going to be twisted. Of course you're going to be contorted in positions that you don't understand. But you can take the time once you've secured that bag or gotten to the top of the summit, you can then take the time to really fucking quiet things down and do some of that work that I bash all the time. It's just you have to win first. <laughs> it's like if you do the work before you won, you're fucked because you're just extinguishing all the flames that are within you that are going to get you there. Word. Thanks, dude. Yeah. Um, the subconscious shit that you've kind of been talking about more recently, I think that's all. It's all just belief at the end of the day. So that's been a big, uh, big thing I'm, I've picked up and appreciate that. Well, the subconscious. Yeah. I mean, dude. Go, go deeper into that. Like, what have you picked up on the subconscious that I've written about? Because I'm sure a lot of people are also probably grappling with the same things. I think just, just quieting the conscious mind and, and the reprogramming aspect, right? Like just rooting out all of the shit that was, was literally ingrained and, and coded into you through, through like fake authority and power structures of like growing up in America and, you know, the past two decades. Um, yeah that shit and if you yeah. can kind of like root it out and program in the beliefs that that you want to see for yourself i don't know that's that's the biggest shit i've picked up from you honestly bro i don't know if you uh recognize my voice or not but like i've been riding with you for the past year year and a half so um it's been a fucking ride for me and and just seeing your belief in what you're doing has uh has definitely impacted me in my life and what i'm doing so it's been cool that's dope, bro. I appreciate that a lot. Give us, give us real quick before I move on. Give us the biggest, give me the biggest lesson outside of the subconscious stuff. Give me the biggest lesson that you've learned working with me. This is all unscripted off the cuff, by the way, fellas. That's, this is completely, you are hearing a live, basically, interview. Yeah, it was, it was one you, you kind of talked about recently that, was like completely hit home it's the your fico score is who can you call at fucking 2 a.m because i mean i was i was in a heavy hole right along with you and i was fucking pulling shit out of my ass all summer last summer to to just keep us alive and and like the amount of fucking friends of friends and phone calls that i was able to make to pull shit out of thin air um and Blue you didn't even mind. know that shit existed at the time. Yeah, exactly. No, but it's just given me much more confidence to go out in my own ventures and, and just be able to pick up the fucking phone, honestly. Fuck yeah, brother. I appreciate that input a lot, man. Adrian. Yo, bro. 
so there's funny. one space where you talked about how like MMA fighters have like a childlike personality. Would you would you say that that's like the true nature of a man? Fuck yeah, dude. Dude, the things you learn on the schoolyard, like the schoolyard life translates perfectly to adulthood. Like that's the natural state of things. That's like what I'm that's basically like the embodiment of my whole work is about not interfering with that process. <laughs> like the personalities, the archetypes you see on the fucking schoolyard, the generals, the bullies, the fucking the meek kids. They don't like, give a fuck. They don't give a fuck, dude. They don't give a fuck. Their subconscious is running everything. And we sort of get hurt and we get pain and we, we experience lack of, of nurture in our environment. And then we essentially cast all of these very strange weapons around the hurt. And then we become adults and we lash out and act out in ways that we don't even fucking fathom happened because we're trying to protect ourselves from the ever experiencing the pain that we experienced when we were young. And that's why everybody's super fucked up. Everybody's yeah. super fucked up because every because dude, it could be the smallest thing, and like you, you, no one knows really what it was. Like some people experience humiliations that other people don't even flinch at, and then they like a guy gets rejected by a girl, and now he's got to be the biggest Casanova the world has ever fucking seen. He's got to conquer every fucking digit. He's got to fucking bag every fucking chick the rest of his life to get vengeance over that. And it's like, dude, we see these we see these phenomenons all over fucking nature. It's incredible. It's really yeah, incredible how the body responds to pain and, and what the body will gift you, the strength that it'll gift you to push through the fucking the bounties, the fucking personality traits that will just all of a sudden be instilled in you to fucking push through the mud. It's fucking extraordinary. But most people see these as evil things. People people actually walk around the world thinking the ego is a bad thing. It's like how you're rejecting your own body you're rejecting your own makeup you're rejecting humanity like what the fuck is that make you have to like integrate it into your like actual like spirit so like you have to like have the ego as like it's your it's your main like ambition self kind of but you have to like integrate it too well yeah i mean it inflates you but look at the animal kingdom i mean weak animals inflate themselves all the time to ward off predators right we got fucking fish in the sea that fucking puff up to look bigger than they are you got all sorts of organisms and life forms are using puffery and fucking defense adaptations to ward off predators. Humans are no fucking different. I mean, the, the body will instill random fucking forces in you to ward off potential threats and fucking predators. It's like you got to look at the fucking animal kingdom. It's all there. 100%. Kind of like a big reflection of everything, yeah? 100%, dude. It's a fucking fractal. Here, we're going to act. Thanks, brother. 100%, yeah. Yo, yo, Ronak. Ronak. Hey, bro. Appreciate your content. Can what? you hear me? Yep. Um, just wanted to, uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on, like, the lone wolf mentality and, um, like, can you just, like, you know, in, in today's age, um, can you just get it all by yourself? Or do you, do you believe in the in the concept of, like, building a network and building a team? No, so, the, so you cannot do it by yourself. That's a veritable fact. However, there is a phase in a young man's life where I do think the lone wolf archetype is very valid. And that's when he's going into that deconditioning process, removing the interior voices of influence in his head, figuring himself out, figuring out his life, redirecting these energies. And then once he goes off and leaves the nest and proves to himself that he can stand on his own two feet and fend for himself, sink or swim, provide a living for himself, put food in his own mouth without fucking parental supervision, parental help, anybody else's help. That's when he can reintegrate back into society. But until a man can prove and go out there and tussle and go toe to toe with these forces and figure that shit out, I do think that period of solace, because that's a popular thing on this side of Twitter, right? Guys talk about solace and solitude, and that's where you kind of find yourself. That is true to a large degree. But the thing is, once you figure that out, you do absolutely have to come back and integrate into society. If you just stay lone wolf forever, you end up a complete fucking weirdo. Like, I could name a hundred examples right now. I'm not going to. 
No, I, I understand. Um, appreciate you, bro. Yep. Yo, Mr. Hunter. Yo, Bird, how you doing? What's up, bro? So, I think this was two or three spaces ago. You were discussing entropy. And I, um, I'm i in university. I'm studying chemistry and physics and whatnot. And it really piqued my interest about how that applies to the disorder of life. Can you, I know this is kind of off topic, but can you touch on that, my man? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm all about trying to maximize serendipity and the the most the most beautiful things that will ever happen to you. And also there's a flip side to that coin. The most atrocious things that will happen to you is in max entropy states where there's max chaos. Ninety percent of the most serendipitous things will happen to you just by being in the scene. Being in the scene itself is 90 percent of it. And when I say maximize entropy, what I'm really saying is, is that the guys who and look, there's nuance to this. The guys who need all this structure and discipline to carry out their daily goals, they lose to the guy who can lord over chaos every fucking day of the week. The guy who can adapt, the guy who's not fucking planning for tomorrow, the guy who doesn't give a fuck if World War Three breaks out because he knows he'll fucking adapt and figure it the fuck out. That guy always wins. Always. Through and through. And if we're talking about quality of life here, which we are, because that's sort of like the seminal, it's sort of like the germinal aspect of my work is about quality of life, not necessarily the figures in the bank, not necessarily the accomplishments, but it's just more about juice and quality of life and experiencing things that ordinary people don't experience, then that's the situation that you want to be in. Look, university is a great example. All the best students that I know the post-prominent debauchers. Like the problem with nerds and the problems with guys who go to school and kind of miss out on a lot of life experience is they've never experienced debauchery. And any of the smartest people that I know, even the exceptional students who, who did experience debauchery, they choose the life of the senses over the life of mind every time. And it's a tragedy when you see a very smart dude who's so smart that he constantly tricks himself into playing a safe life because gifted people have a certain protection over ordinary people. This is what people don't understand. It's like the marginal benefits of abstinence don't make any sense because if you're gifted, you're granted a certain kind of protection. For example, I could be in a fucking hungover state every day. Literally. I know this about myself. I could fucking drink every day if I really wanted to and be hungover daily. And I would still run laps around 95% of people because you can only scalp a certain, you can only degrade a certain percentage off your baseline genetics, no matter how bad you fuck yourself up. So gifted people have that protection. And so if you're super fucking smart, the problem with look, being super intelligent is a fucking curse, by the way, it's a fucking curse. There is an IQ level and there is a social intelligence level that you literally do not want to hit. It's a dragon within you that you have to suppress because you are so hyper aware of your environment and social situations that you start to like trip over yourself and start to fucking act autistic. And it's like, (laughs) I'm talking about debauchery because I think it threads in perfectly. I think alcohol is a cure. Like if you're a fucking genius, I think alcohol is the perfect fucking drug for geniuses. Because it allows you to interact and embrace the common man. It allows you to have a normal conversation and sort of slink into the normalcy of life. You don't, and it's, it's like the guy that just talked to us before about being the lone wolf. You don't want to be the kind of guy who's so extraordinary that you no longer have a toehold in the commoner's life. That's a certain type of misery that is very difficult to comprehend. Go read Ralph Waldo Emerson. Go read some of these motherfuckers who rusticated and peregrinated to the countryside and never came back and wrote these phenomenal works. They became weirdos, social fucking weirdos. So it's like, no matter how great you become, you always want to have your hand dipped into the till of the common man. You know what I'm saying? Like me coming on Twitter and doing these spaces is how I relate and connect to ordinary people. 
It's a good fucking feeling. It gives me sanity that I can bring people up on this show live and understand that people understand my work and I can fucking connect to people. It's a fucking great feeling. That's why I keep doing it. Like you don't want to be estranged. You know what I'm saying? Like this is what, this is what I was talking about in that post the other day when I said, I think this was like a month ago. I said Nietzsche was too strong. It's true. Nietzsche became so strong and so powerful that he could no longer accept his own shortcomings and he became too rigid. He became too rigid and he, he did die a loser. I mean, obviously he fucking left us some fucking phenomenal works to fucking mull through. But the point remains is like, you still want to have a hand in reality. You don't want to estrange yourself too far because then there's no coming back. So like you're talking about maximizing entropy, brother. It means that you just need to be in the fucking scene. Not in your fucking apartment staring at fucking Kobe Bryant posters trading crypto 24 hours a day. Go grab a fucking drink, step out into the real fucking world and say hi to a bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it becomes that basic now. It, like the common sense has been so vitiated that in 2023, you tell a motherfucker to go outside and rock up to a bar. That's like fucking mind blowing advice. <laughs> So, so question kind of built on top of that. Do you think that, so the term, you don't know what you don't know, like in terms of entropy, like, is that the reason why you would increase entropy so that you get new factors, new cofactors, new things introduced into your life that you wouldn't have in that normal day to day? Exactly. You wouldn't be able to seize that particular opportunity. Like the way I live is so free flowing. I'm so free every day. I'm just, I'm swinging sort of effortlessly, but I'm also trying. It's paradoxical. I put in a lot of effort, but everything that I do is also lighthearted. It's fun. I don't do anything that's not enjoyment. And so it's like the opportunities that I see and that I'm able to find these different angles comes from just having that free flowing identity. So like things will happen to me that an ordinary person could never fucking comprehend, but it's because I give myself an opportunity to get lucky every day. Most people never give themselves an opportunity to get lucky ever. They're just working a job. They're on a fucking ceiling salary. They have no shots that are painted in any other market. They have 0.0% chance of anything overwhelmingly spectacular happening to them. And I'm the opposite. My day to day is kind of brutal because I don't have a lot of fucking stability or infrastructure, but my upside is unreal. Like un extraordinary things can happen to me on a daily basis because of the way I live. I get the weirdest deals come across my desk, the weirdest fucking partnerships, the fucking craziest fucking deals, the craziest sums of money will fall into my lap because I'm just carelessly in this sort of Zen state, just kind of flowing with shit. I don't take things too seriously. I just love the game of life and I love life itself. Does that make sense? Like my $17 million story is a fucking perfect, perfect encapsulating example for what I just said. Mm -hmm. So do you think that there's a cap? Do you think that there's a cap then if you, if you take like the Jordan Peterson approach and you make everything completely orderly and you just try to win through order, just specifically speaking in sense of business, like a lot of people do have success with that but do you think that there's a cap to that well they have success in the in the sense that they have the stability of finances like they're never going to go broke but here's the thing they're never going to go broke but they also ain't ever going to have an orgy with three art hoes you know what i'm saying so it's like you're yeah. you're you're handicapped on an, a whole other spectrum of life whereas the guy who's in free fall and doesn't really give a fuck wins more often than not but his wins are much greater his losses are also greater too though you know what i'm saying but like me being willing to torch the 17 m's allowed me the freedom to go make it back rather e- uh, easily like i've hit i've hit close to that number a couple times along the way like it's just been an ebb and flow i just kind of undulate with life and i just kind of fucking just kind of have eased my way into everything that i do does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Entropy, you, is maximized, entropy is maximized at all times. I mean, I got jackpots that can pop off. I got like five or six different jackpots that can pop off every day. 
Like the opportunity does exist. The chances are low, but the opportunity is real that every single day I wake up, there are some jackpots that will go off that will be life changing. And in the meantime, I can just brave and sail through the storms of life and handle it very well until those jackpots are triggered. Got you. Got you. So just one more question then Go for in it. terms of, in terms of beliefs, do you think it's more advantageous to think that you create your luck or that it's mostly up to fate? And I'm, and I'm talking just your personal beliefs. No, I think we create our own luck. 100%. 100 fucking percent. Got it. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Of course, bro. Yo, yo, KB 2.0. What's going on? Yo, yo, you hear me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I yo, did not mute. Yo, myself. I hear you. What's your, um, thank you for having me. What's your take on placebo? Yo. Hello? Yo, four. We'll get to you after, bro. Hold you got on. it. Sorry. Um, what's your take on placebo and you believing in yourself on the mission? Thank you. Bro, placebo is everything. Like, I think people should be crushing and snorting fucking blue pills every day of their life. The truth is the truth. The the greatest epiphany that I've had recently is the truth about yourself is is very impractical. Like sitting here and accepting the fact that you have weaknesses doesn't do jack shit for you. It doesn't move any needles. It just turns you into, like I said, a self-introspecting, self-analyzing weirdo. Like you should literally be walking around believing you are the most handsome, intelligent, charming, funny motherfucker walking the face of the earth. I don't see any downsides to that. Like, you should be literally, dude, huffing fucking blue pills like addicts huff paint. The shit's fucking potent, man, these belief systems. Like, I have outrageous belief. It's so outrageous, it's it's delusional. I have delusional self-belief. Because I don't, I never have a plan. I never know how I'm going to get things done. I don't need to know how. I just need to know that it is going to get done. That's all I need to know. As long as I know that I am going to get something done, I don't need to know how it's going to happen. I'm just going to fucking live my life and I'm going to pounce the very fucking minute that I perceive that that opportunity is presenting itself. That's the most powerful fucking feeling. It's a majestic feeling. Hard to explain. Hard to explain when you are blessed with that kind of fucking recognition and cognition. That you don't even have to know. You just know that you are. And I've, I've lived, I, essentially, I placeboed my way into that reality. Because I've never known how I was going to pull off my greatest tricks. I never had a fucking clue. I didn't even have, like, people would say, okay, so what's your plan? How are you going to get out of this? How are you going to fucking go on the next run? How are you going to fucking recapitalize, et cetera? I'm like, dude, I don't fucking know, but I just know that I am. And if you give me enough time, <laughs> I'm going to show you the fucking ninth wonder of the world. And it's happened every time. I have so much experience and fucking evidence stacked up to prove that that's happened. So I don't need a different fucking universal model. This is a great question. Four, what's up, bro? All right. Yo. What's What's good, brother, man? Hope you're having a good night. Quick question. Um, Fuck you. Let me run it down real quick. First popped off my head when you said... It's really about fucking your own head, bro. So I'd have days where I'm, my past was so nuts that some days I'm going through the day like, dog, telling myself practically, yo, you almost fucking died. You can get through this day. <clears throat> so where I'm at now is I'm busting my ass two jobs. Um, I'm training my ass off while at the same time I'm a fucking opiate addict through and through, drinking alcohol. So my question is, I know this shit. There's no end in sight, and I'm cool with that. I'm not going to give up. But the question is, what's the fucking right move to take between these two bullshit jobs and just keep carrying on 
or <clears throat> there is no fucking right step, is it? No, there is a right step. You have to set the bar higher as far as like your actual status in society has to be higher so that you have something to protect. The problem with most addicts, bro, is they don't have a life that's worth protecting. They haven't really mm. built anything. They haven't built anything for themselves so that mm. they can just hit the reset button every fucking day and they're like, fuck it. You just get Facts. the fuck out of the spot. Yeah, yeah, I've been going right. to level from level one to level four. Yeah, brother, don't, don't, don't level brother, one. Brother, yeah, yeah, brother, yeah. When, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking, you're not talking. Um, the, the deal is, is that like when you, when you hit that button, that reset button every day and you're like, fuck, uh-huh. I'm not making any progress. Let's just go back to zero every fucking day. Mm. That's the fucking sickness. That's mm. the fucking sickness. So it's like you have to use that energy to get to a higher fucking status point than you are where you mm. actually have something worth protecting that you can hold on to where it's not fucking cute anymore to hit the reset button because there's mm-hmm. too much on the line. That's the only fucking way to orchestrate. You know what I mean? It's like, for me, I got a fucking kid to feed. I got mouths to feed. I got fucking child support. I got fucking, I have a huge life. I have a lot of people that count on me. Mm -hmm. I have fucking debts to pay. I have a lot of shit that's on my plate. And that's what keeps me fucking centered. And that's what keeps me alive every fucking day is knowing that there's people counting on me. I can't afford to hit the reset button. You know what I mean? It's not, this isn't a game of Sims where you can take that fucking white glove and just start fucking racing cities. So I have more more on my plate, essentially. More true stakes that can give you pride and ownership in fucking taking care of other people, man. Yeah. Like, you you cannot go far in this life if you do not give back to people. You have to feed your own people. You have to fucking take care of anybody who's ever believed in you, man. That is literally the fucking solution to most people's problems. And the only way you can do that... The only way you can do that is to fucking steer yourself in a direction where you have a little bit more financial power and more power to make that happen. Like, th- you don't have a choice, brother. You have to climb to that level or you're going to fucking kill yourself. I mean, it's a serious thing. I'm not fucking yes. making light of addiction at all, bro. Like, what you're going through is a very, very serious fucking thing. Your life's at stake here. Yeah. It is, and it's really at a point where, like you said, being not giving a fuck about yourself to a point where it has to be other people which definitely is the truth. I have to put those people first or else I don't care about me enough to fucking go as hard as possible. So I see that angle for sure. Exactly, bro. I mean, it's about scaling. Like, that, you have to play the game of capitalism. It's, it's mm-hmm. that simple. You have to gain power over your local domain and you have to get yourself in a financial position where you can start making moves. That is the only fucking answer. Because with power, you mm-hmm. are going to have to maintain that standard. Right. The, you disgust, have to... the, the disgust of going down another rung on the ladder is going to make you fucking sick. Mm-hmm. Truly. So you have to get something to lose. If I have nothing to lose, it's like who gives a shit? Like you said, reset. Definitely can relate to that. Yeah, your life's a video game right now, bro. You can just fucking fuck it up. Every, you can fuck it up every day if you want to and nothing's going to change. Like you're the same guy you always were. Yeah, true but it, gets, it gets worse. It gets worse because then everyone's like, fuck, this guy's in his 30s. He's still making the same mistakes. And then everybody walks away from you. And then that shame of being alienated mm-hmm. drives you deeper into the fucking opiate. Yeah, it's not cute. That's where, that's where, that's where, it, that's where it gets spooky. It's like, dude, it's cute when you're 19 years old and you're digging right. holes for yourself. People will bail you out. But when you're 30 years old and you're in the same fucking hole year after year, it ain't cute anymore. Right. And so what I'm getting from this, Brute, is to set a bigger goal because – Pussy came good to me. Women, no issues. Um, great shape, strong as shit. And so I'm thinking, I already won. You know what I mean? But in reality, it's setting that bigger goal that I can take care of the family and whoever else needs the uh, whoever else needs it. Exactly, because you're going to ricochet a lot of that energy to uh, engage in self harm. You're going to ricochet that energy into something that you can actually start to take pride in. Mm-hmm. You know I mean? It becomes an esteemable act. Right. It becomes, it becomes an esteemable act to watch your creations come to life. Mm-hmm. Cool, man. So, you got, so yeah, bro. That's, uh, I appreciate you being so raw. Cool. Hey, take care, bro. I'll see you. Yep. All right. <clears throat>